Uh, welcome everyone. We're going to be chatting about automatic Drupal updates using visual regression testing. So hopefully you're in the right place. I appreciate everyone sticking with the last talk of the day. I know uh, it's tempting to kind of go have a big long lunch and not come back. Um, link to the slides are up here. My name is Andrew Taylor, uh, agency and community engineer at Pantheon. So helping with our agency partners and then you know, contributing back um, conferences and things like that. Me, Taylor, and me on GitHub and Twitter also tweeted out the slide links, so if you want to grab those, you can. Um, some more info about me, but more importantly than all of these things, uh, I am a maintainer of websites, and I have been for many years, like I'm assuming most of you have been, when friends or family find out, oh, you build websites? Cool, I need to get me one of those, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're on the hook for, I don't know, I have websites from like uh, a photographer buddy, I'm like, oh, you should totally have a portfolio, I'll help you build that. And I'm still updating a site, right? Mm -hmm. Like, raise your hand if you, yeah? Mm -hmm. You're updating a site you don't want to be updating? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to figure out, and that's what we're <laughs> gonna be talking about today. Um, so I want to start with like the importance of automatic updates and just kind of updates in, de in general, like why does this even matter? Uh, so if we look at automatic updates and we look at some applications now, they're starting to become sort of versionless. Like I'm running Chrome right now and I can't even tell you what version it is. We're not going to download a new package or doing updates. These, these things are kind of self-updating. And I really think we can take a Drupal to that same level of being self-updating, but we want to do it in a smart way. Um, you'll notice one of the logos up here is WordPress, uh, and the reason for that is they've been doing automatic updates uh, for a, a long time, like five years or something, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and so this was a pretty interesting statistic from a security update they released. Uh, like within hours, millions of sites are updated. And so this is automatic updates, but it's still not a great approach because in order for this to work, you have to have writable files in your production environment that the security updates are being forcibly pushed to. Well, we're all responsible developers. We know cowboy coding is bad, so we don't want to do that, let alone having writable files that, you know, if someone starts hacking your site, they can just be creating things, we want to lock down our production environment. Um, so this really doesn't, doesn't work, but we can see that uh, it's maybe a step uh, in the right direction. We're going to try and go a little bit farther. So I want to kind of like reference again why this is important. If we think back to Drupal Geddon, at, at Pantheon we saw, you know, just basically people going down the list of domains and, and trying to hack sites. Um, and Within hours, sites were compromised, and the official statement says within seven hours, you could expect every site that's not patched to be compromised. That's pretty scary stuff. Um, if we look at the way, you know, I when I first started doing web development, I would update sites is maybe there's a security patch, um, and this is kind of racing the clock, right? If, if there's something major, um, where you go in and if, I'm at an agency and we have you know, 15, 20 sites. I'm going one at a time, going to our staging environment, applying the update, clicking around, doing some QA, make sure things look good, and move on to the next one. And even if we have two, three, four people doing this, it's still a very long manual process, uh, and it's really just no fun. Like No one wants to be doing that work. You're being pulled away from developing and billable hours and other things that are going on. Um, so we, you know, you kind of maybe that evolves a little bit and you write an update script. So you're going in and, all right, sweet. I have a script and I'm gonna run Drush and I'm gonna automatically apply updates to staging. But we still have to do QA. Um, and maybe that process takes a couple hours, but we're still racing against the Drupal getting clock. And that's assuming you started right when like it was announced. Uh, maybe you were sleeping, maybe you're away from the computer, maybe you know, you're out with your kids on the weekend, whatever it is. Uh, you're, you're not always going to be there sitting waiting for a security update. We want to get on with our lives. Um, and so how can we take this uh, from a mass update script, maybe where we're updating staging and still need to do QA, to full automation? That's kind of where we're going to bring in the visual regression testing and some automated deployment pieces. Um, 
So before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about continuous integration um, and how that fits in. And we're actually going to be kind of hacking it a little bit to run this visual regression stuff. Uh, so if you're not familiar with continuous integration, it's really just offloading redundant tasks uh, to the robots to go run these things. So this might be installing dependencies with Composer, compiling SAS, doing some uh, checks for coding standards and rejecting pull requests if they don't meet coding standards, automated testing, deployments, uh, these sorts of things, communication. It's great if you want to, like, every time we deploy, we're going to post a message in Slack so the whole team knows what's going on. A lot of these things uh, CI can help you with, but it's also just a server that you can spin up that will have production parity. Um, it can be run either on every code push or on cron, which we're going to take advantage on, uh, of running it on cron. Um, and sort of, you can have different tests for different branches. You could have larger tests uh, for like full QA before before you go from like staging to production versus maybe you have environments for each uh, pull request or something like that. So we're going to kind of take these continuous integration servers. Um, this is just a screenshot from Circle CI and bend them to our will a little bit to do these um, automatic updates. So visual regression is a really great uh, way to do um, testing. And it's kind of something that maybe you've dabbled around with like unit testing or BHAT or something else. Visual regression is, is kind of new to a lot of people. Um, what I've used is Backstop.js. It's kind of a, a wrapper around Wraith. Um, but there's a lot of tools out there. There's services out there that'll do it. There's, there's other products. So just kind of find what works for you. Uh, Backstop is just what I happen to be using. But essentially, visual regression is taking screenshots and comparing the difference. Um, and that in itself is, is not super powerful. Like, I can look at a web page. You can look at a web page. We can kind of tell the difference between uh, two things. Well, maybe not. Like, here's image A. Here's image B. Uh, if we put them side by side, maybe you can catch the difference, maybe you can't. Um, and we come in here and say, okay, well, these like titles go from blue to green. But maybe you didn't catch the little read more link or something. And these are the sorts of things that we can offload to robots, and they're really good at it. They're going to catch it everything all of the time. It's going to get it off our plate, but they can also handle it at scale. So it's fine if we want to just quickly look at the home page on every site. But if you have 20 sites, now you're looking at 20 pages. What if, what if each of those, you want to QA more than the home page? What if each of them has 10 pages, 100 pages, times those 20 sites? Well, now that's just too much work for us to do. Um, so we're going to offload that. And what's really nice about these visual regression tools is uh, they actually create reports and things. You can get items like this. I've seen folks using visual regression in clever ways like posting screenshots to every pull request. And so you can see like if there were differences, oh yeah, well I'm developing, uh, I'm changing stuff on this template, I expect a difference, like this is what has changed, it's good. Or maybe something like we ran security updates, there should not be differences. Um, so sort of helping you catching those things uh, and, and again taking that QA load off of your plate. They also have support for like multiple viewports and sizes. So you could do desktop and mobile and, and compare things at different sizes. Um, and they can crawl your entire site, so you don't have to uh, worry about not, not viewing uh, every single different layout on a site. There are some limitations to visual regression testing. Um, there, there can be some noise, and you, you can set a level of tolerance. So you can say, like, OK, if anything is not 100%, we want to fail the test. Or you could crank that up and say, maybe I'll tolerate 5% difference. Um, and that's okay. Uh, and that can, they're, they're, if you're down in like 0%, you can get some false positives. Um, another difficulty it has is with dynamic content. So if I have a page with like a sliding banner or a random testimonial, um, there's ways you can go in and like plug those div IDs in and ignore them. Um, but that just kind of, like takes away from the test a little bit because now you're not testing those areas um, if, if something does go wrong. So uh, visual regression testing um, is really great for 
security updates because we're not expecting anything visual to change with the security update. We're expecting to run it and the front end of the site is going to be exactly the same. Um, so that's why it's a good use case here. Here's like an example of, of just the patch for uh, Drupal Geddon um, and like a site before and after. And you know, if you can spot the difference, maybe there's not one uh, because it's exactly the same. Um, but that's what our visual regression testing is going to look at. And so here's sort of what the process looks like. Um, we could run this on a cron, so you can run it, you know, every day, every hour, um, and you can actually run it, you know, for each of the projects you have uh, independently of each other. So maybe this is something that you just want to set up and. Every night at midnight, you're just going to check all of your sites for updates. Um, maybe you're going to check every hour, uh, something like that. But the idea is you come in, uh, check, and if everything is up to date, you know we can just use Drush and say are there updates available. If there's no, if there's not, you can script it out. So maybe you're going to email the client, tell them you check their site, tell them everything's up to date. Here's the versions of all your stuff, uh, and maybe at the end of the month we'll give you an invoice because we're doing maintenance. Right? Um, I, I've seen, uh, you know, interact with a lot of agencies who are kind of fearful of taking the maintenance retainers because it's, it is a lot of work and a lot of burden to do that. Uh, but if we can automate that process, you can keep those maintenance retainers, you keep um, a better relationship with your client because you don't just hand off the project and not talk to them. You, you keep building that long-term relationship. Maybe they're come, gonna come back to you for the next thing because they're still working with you. Uh, their site's up to date, they're happy, you're happy because um, you can bill for this thing. If there are updates, then we're gonna spin up a new Git branch, we're gonna pull all of our database and media files and things uh, from production down into our site. We're going to uh, apply and commit our new updates, and then we're gonna run our visual regression test. So we're gonna take screenshots between the existing live site, our new environment we spun up uh, and applied the updates to, and then additional testing. I wanna emphasize additional testing because like we said, with the visual regression testing, it's, it's good for security updates because you, know, you don't expect the front end of the site to change, but there are items that it won't catch, especially if you're ignoring dynamic content or if I'm running an e-commerce site, the shopping cart is pre pretty business critical um, and an update could break the cart and visually the little cart button looks fine, but if checkout doesn't work, that's an issue. Um, so this is a good, you know, starting place and visual regression is a nice baseline, but depending on your needs, uh, create additional tests and make sure you get that test coverage up to a level that you're comfortable with uh, the risk, that you've mitigated enough risk, that you're comfortable with these things shipping out when all of your tests pass. So maybe I'm going to write a BHAT test that's going to mock like a user scenario going through the shopping cart and run that as well. Maybe I'm going to have some unit tests for very important pieces of my API to make sure that it's still displaying the data that uh, needs to be out there because visual regression isn't going to check my JSON endpoints. Right? Um, so those sorts of things. So additional testing is important. Visual regression gives you, gives you a nice starting place, but definitely uh, test other items as well. So we go in, uh, we compare, our sites are equal, uh, no issues. Then we're gonna go ahead, merge uh, that branch back into master, deploy our updates maybe to a staging environment, run any additional tests. So at this point, you can maybe run um, a load test and throw some like actual live traffic at it, check performance, whatever sorts of other tests you, you normally run in QA, you also want to run when you're applying these security updates. Uh, and once everything looks good, then we're gonna go ahead and deploy to our live site, send it out to production. Um, and then, of course, you know we're gonna send those invoices. Uh, but what happens if there are issues and things go wrong? Well, sometimes there's false positives, sometimes you know an update will actually have a legitimate <laughs> difference. Well, if we get, you know, think of those reports we saw, that's much easier to look at in QA if you have those 100, 1,000 URLs and it's like, oh, these five URIs are different. Let's go look at those templates. I can go in and, and fix those problems and then move on with my life instead of playing needle in the haystack or you know, the old way of maybe crossing our fingers or we're gonna check like 
the major things on our list, but we're not checking the uh, entire functionality of the site, which you can do with the automated testing. So we're starting with uh, kind of where WordPress went a little bit about you know pushing updates out automatically, but we're doing it without the level of risk. We can still lock down our production environment, have the automated tests, uh, take care of some of that risk for us, and then deploy things out. So you will need uh, some items to run this. Um, uh, continuous integration solution. Uh, I use CircleCI. There's a ton of others. Like it, it really doesn't matter what you use. Um, some of them, like uh, Travis, has uh, cron function built in. I think it's in beta right now. Um, CircleCI, I'm just pulling their API every hour and telling it to run a job. Um, you could write a bash script and just run it with like cron uh, if you have a server somewhere. All sorts of ways to get started there. Uh, you need a command line tool, so we're actually you know, going to be using Drush and things to run the Drupal updates, right? Um, but then you also need the environment you're deploying to uh, to be scriptable. So if we're creating that new development environment and we're applying updates to it and then we're merging it in and shipping it, you need to be able to automate that process. Um, if you get to get up to the point where you, you know, you spin up Circle CI and you they can't like create an environment from the command line, you can't script it out. If you have to open a ticket with your IT team, well that kind of kills this whole automated process. So it's making sure uh, you have a platform that you can work with on the command line as well. We do have sample code. Um, I want to give some props to Kyle Hall who helped out with this a little bit, and then uh, Matt Cheney, one of our uh, co-founders at Pantheon. Uh, wrote the Drupal 8 version that we're going to um, take a look at. So that link is in here in the slides if you want to go view that. Uh, but let's actually go like check it out and let's run this thing. So uh, normally this runs, we start the build through the API. I'm just going to come in and uh, click through the build manually here uh, and fire it off. And so this is the site we're looking at. It's just sort of this basic uh, museum site that we've kind of seen in the screenshots and things like that. If we come over uh, to the Pantheon side, we can see like we actually have some Drupal updates available. Um, so we can update to uh, 831. Um, so that's sitting here, that's waiting. Um, and then we're just gonna kind of check out and watch the script run and see uh, everything going on. One of the nice things about this is we also have it hooked up to Slack. Um, so because we're scripting and automating these things, a lot of third-party services uh, have an API you can work with as well. So you know, we use Slack and they have an API. When we run this, we can actually call out to the Slack API, send some messages uh, to our channel, and let people know what's going on um, as this process fires off. Or maybe you use Jira or something and you just want to create a recurring task that security updates were applied, well, if you automate that and the build passes, just go close out those JIRA tickets. Um, or if the build fails, maybe assign that JIRA ticket to someone to go in and actually do the review and the manual QA, um, those sorts of things. So here we got our message that it's uh, starting up, firing off. Uh, and how many people have, have worked with like visual regression testing before? Is this a fairly new concept? A couple? Uh, what about CI? Uh, uh, a few. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, we, we did like a, we had one of the trainings yesterday on continuous integration. Um, and we're using it for different things. We're using it uh, for some of those build steps we talked about, like installing assets with Composer and compiling Slack and those sorts of things. Um, but this is just kind of showing, again, how you can tweak it and maybe use it for different applications. Um, so there we go. Uh, we're logging into Terminus, which is Pantheon's command line tool. Again, you could swap this out for whatever platform uh, you're working with. And then we're checking for Drupal updates. Um, we see that Drupal updates are available. So now we are applying those updates. Uh, and we're applying them to this update environment. So if I uh, come back over 
to the Pantheon side, I can actually see this update of environment. Um, code is being deployed to it. Uh, and there we go. Like, I didn't do this. This just got committed, um, which is pretty nice. So now we're going to come in. Um, we're going to go in and check for actually contrib updates as well, which is really nice because uh, Drupal core, we get announcements and we kind of know, especially now with the, with the release schedule and things, um, when stuff is coming out so you could plan for it. I have no idea when new updates for Contrib are coming. Um, so there might be some here that when I tested this a couple days ago uh, weren't there. So we can come in, um, we can see that uh, Contrib updates are available. It looks like en entity reference revisions and paragraphs have updates. Um, so we're just running Drosh PM update code, uh, going in, posting a nice little fun GIF here um, to start the testing. Backstop is kicking off, so this is taking those screenshots between uh, the live environment and our update environment. Um, and now it actually, the test passed and it's deploying out uh, to our development environment. So we can see that it's being merged into master uh, right here. And so once that's uh, done, then we're gonna go through run additional testing that you would need to. Uh, we talked about maybe you have B hat, or maybe you wanna run a performance testing and things like that. Um, and once those pass, then we can actually ship it out to production as well. So here we go. Uh, And if you wanted to, you could come in and, and kind of check out the logs in Circle. Um, this is really nice if something goes wrong. Like these are pretty verbose logs. It's telling you like line by line uh, what sort of, you know, bash commands are being run, what's going on with our screenshots, um, things like that. So now uh, it passed on like this environment, so now we're just deploying out to the next one. So we can see auto update uh, of our deploy a few seconds ago, um, and then we're gonna run one more test, uh, and then it will deploy out to our live environment. So creating a backup first on the live environment, probably a good idea before you ship anything out. Um, so that's something else we can automate as part of this process. And again, it's items that we as humans like could write down a list. Maybe you have internal documentation on, you should create a backup before you deploy, but someone's in a, in a rush, and they're crunched for time, they're under pressure, they forget to do that step. Uh, we make mistakes. If we script this out properly, then the robots aren't gonna make the mistakes. They're gonna remember to do everything every time. Uh, so there we go, deployed out. Um, so we could see that happening. Um, and then I'd go show you like the difference in the environments, but there is no difference since these are just security updates. That's kind of the whole point. Uh, but that's sort of what the process looks like. And then um, we see the you know screenshot posted here um, of, of the site after the updates. So that is uh, sort of the process in a nutshell. I would encourage you guys to sort of think about it and think about the way maybe you do maintenance on sites and how you can take some uh, take advantage of some of the tools we have available to us, especially with Drupal 8, um, and we're you know having more backwards compatibility. Uh, hopefully, the point where even we get more features and things like that coming out, we can just start rolling those out and not worrying about it. Uh, so now can actually uh, have time for some Q&A. Um, I tweaked the demo a bit and it actually uh, went a little faster, which is nice. We were able to cruise through this, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. So this is something you wrote in Rage and Backstop, or it's something that's available out there now? Yeah, so I can pull up uh, Backstop.js. Um, so Backstop.js, like uh, Wraith and some of the tools for the headless browsers are really powerful and they can do a ton of stuff, uh, but they're also pretty cumbersome to configure um, to get them set up. 
And so Wraith, is, our backstop is just like a wrapper um, around Wraith. You can also use like Slimer JS as another um, headless option it wraps around. But it basically gives you a cleaner, smaller API that's whole purpose is to do screenshotting and visual regression testing and show the difference. So it takes like the million things you can do with a headless browser and having to worry about all that and just kind of focuses in on doing one task really well. Um, I know like Chrome has come out with a headless version as well and you can take screenshots with it. So I'd imagine there's gonna be uh, an evolution in tools that are gonna interact with like the native headless Chrome um, that is now you know scriptable on the command line uh, and work with that. I'm, you know that that's like relatively new in the last uh, I think month. So you know it's probably give it a little time before those tools come out. But there's there's lots of options out there. I just like Backstop because it was uh, based on Node and it, it runs pretty quickly and it has some nice features like being able to ignore dynamic content, adjust your threshold uh, for what you want to accept. You know, like, oh, 10% is okay because my site's kind of, you know, has a lot going on or whatever. Um, and also, it, it can crawl some URLs. Um, so there's a couple of other tools I looked at that I had to, like, hard code URLs. Well, what if a client adds new content or this or yeah. like? Um, so I like this because it was able to spider as well. Any other questions? So you, uh, to, to fire off the process of it checking for updates, and then going through and applying and all that stuff, you manually click the, the button in Circle CI. But what are some strategies or techniques for automating that, since, like you mentioned at midnight or? Yeah, so uh, Circle CI actually has an API that you can start builds from. Um, so you can set up this build to run this process of checking for updates, doing the testing and deploying and all of that. Uh, I, I just went in and manually clicked the button, but you can go in and uh, just set up something that ping their API like every hour and fire off the job. Um, so there's like free cron job and there's a, like a lot of services out there that you can just say, I'll go to this URL like every hour um, and authorize and that sort of thing. And um, Travis has, like I said, in beta that you can create um, builds on there and just tell it to run every hour and they'll kind of do it automatically without any work. Or if you have your own server, uh, if we go in and like take a look at the um, demo repo, uh, it's, most of the work is just uh, Bash script. So I'm doing this on Circle CI because it's an environment that has the tools I need. So I can spin up an environment that has you know Node.js to run the visual regression testing, and I need like PHP and things to run some other tests. Uh, but you could come in, and if you had an environment that you could run this on. Um, you could just go in, maybe it's you know a VM you have somewhere, your internal IT team has a server you can go play around on. Uh, you could just use like native Linux cron to run the script at, at whatever frequency you want. Um, the nice thing about doing it on CI is you could set it up uh, for multiple sites. Like eventually if you had your own server, if you run one site, that's fine, but what if you do 10 or 20 or 30? Like running these all the time is gonna suck up some resources. So being able to have uh, sort of the concurrent builds running with CI is nice. Um, one thing we run into sometimes with the, particularly with the contrib part of of what you showed, the, yep. the idea of like checking for contrib security updates at the same time. We occasionally have things where we um, either we patch a module and we don't, there's a particular reason we don't want to go to the next version, even if it is a security update, but we know either there's a mitigating factor that means we don't really need to worry about that security update or we've actually patched whatever the security issue is in the older version. And so we wouldn't ever want to even try to deploy that. So I, mean, I, I don't expect you to, I'm just sort of tossing out ideas like you could maybe like build a blacklist of things uh, not to check well, or something. I wouldn't quite build a blacklist, but in that case, rather than using Drush, I would manage uh, your contrib stuff with, with Composer. Um, because when you define stuff in Composer, you can lock 
some modules down to a very specific version. You can also apply patches with Composer, so you can get your patches in there. Um, but then other versions that you want to update, you could say, you know, I'll, I will accept minor updates for this module, and then every hour when you're running the script, instead of doing updates with Drush, you're running Composer update mm -hmm. if items are available, generating the new lock file, and then having the rest of your build process move on, like build the site, and then test against that. Um, so I think that would be a pretty good way to handle it. And you are also able to say with Drush, like don't update a particular right. There's like a Drush lock. Yeah, you can try right. and you can update status lock option. Right, okay. So you can just lock the ones you don't want to update and then we'll pass the switch to be the same. Because that would be a Drupal 8 solution, but not necessarily yeah. a Drupal 7 solution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Forgot about that. That's good. Cool. Any other questions? Do you consider using machine learning techniques to address the dynamic content problem? I have not. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have that much spare time. <laughs> it, it, it might be a viable approach. I just, it's a, a, definitely a future sort of thing, but yeah. once you get this initial things nailed down, it may be a future approach. Yeah, I think it would depend on, yeah, that would be tough. Because uh, I, I haven't dived into machine learning really at all, but I'd imagine writing the algorithm so it knew what was acceptable and what wasn't uh, could get pretty hairy. It's just more a matter of training the machine learning the machine rather than giving it explicit examples. Anyway, we talk about this later. Yeah. Any other uh, questions or insights? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. Uh, we're a little bit early, but...